But it's a privilege to bring the Word of God to the people of God. And I'm thrilled to hear that the children are learning about the things of God, where they are. It's not entertainment. They are the church. In this building today, this is just one gathering, not the main gathering. There's lots of gatherings of the church around this building. But in this hall this morning, as Mark said, we're going to continue the next session of our First Things First series. And just by a show of hands, he dares to ask, who believes they have been baptized in water? Okay. So as Mark said, you may be thinking, yep, that, that's me, got that, got the t-shirt. Literally, sometimes you get to keep the t-shirt. <laughs> I have been baptized in water. So you think, so what more is there to say? Well, what I've come to know is this, is water baptism is one of the most exciting things that I ever have the privilege to open the Bible and teach about. And it's as, as relevant for me today as it was when I was eight years old at Fairwater Leisure Centre, so a few miles away, in my green little shorts. Some of you were there on the side in your own little shorts and towels as people went into the water and came out to great and rapturous applause, not to the person getting baptized, but to Lord Jesus, because something happens in the water. And if I want you to remember anything today, it's this truth. Something happens in the water. Now, why are we looking at these? Well, Hebrews 6 tells us that there are certain things that need to be laid in the life of every believer. The, just before Easter, we looked at repentance. Last week, Josh did a fantastic job looking at the life of faith. And I do want to encourage you, if you were here last week and you took up that invitation to go to the seminar, either on the Monday and Wednesday last week, this week on Tuesday and Wednesday, you will be immensely blessed. Think, Dave, did you learn anything new? It was all new by faith because I learned some things again that I thought, I've not been walking in the best of that. One thing was made perfectly clear. Uh, Dave Patterson did a, a section on what it is to confess and agree with the word. And a situation came up this week with a friend in this church just by a WhatsApp message saying, I'm facing a situation. Uh, my daughter, she needs a, a, an ultrasound scan and it, she's in a tremendous abdominal pain. But the doctors have told her, even an emergency scan is going to take four weeks minimum. And she doesn't know what to do. Now the daughter, I'm not sure where she is in her relationship with Jesus Christ. So I just said to my friend, well, I hear what the doctors have said. But we serve a good God. Yes. We serve a God who is who he says he is and does what he says he can do. So let's, you and I, agree together that it's not going to be four weeks. That timeline is going to come flying down. Will you agree with me? I will agree with you. Amen. But my daughter's not convinced. Don't worry about your daughter. Let's agree together in the goodness of God. Three hours later, I have a message. It appears there have been some cancellations. It's not going to be a four-week wait. They're seeing her within four days. That is a miracle. Particularly if you have any dealings with the NHS today, that is a miracle. Because faith, these things that we're learning, they're not just to kind of go over to teach you things you already know before. It's because all of these principles are to be grabbed hold of day by day. When we read Hebrews from start to finish, we see far greater context of what is being said in Hebrews 6. And if you just go back into the end of chapter 5, you'll find that it's these things that are uh, put in constant practice. Yes. That is, we put them in daily use. Yes. Now, do, uh, do I need to get water baptized every day? No, but we can live in the good of what happened many years ago today by faith. Yes. Today I gave thanks, partly because I'm teaching on it, that, Lord, I want to say thank you, that uh, I was baptized as an eight-year-old. And even though my memories of it, I've got the photo, even though my memories of the day may be slightly hazy, I can't remember every single moment. But Lord Jesus, something happened in the water. The old was taken away and the new life in Christ was given to me. And today, one of three things will happen for you. If you are not a Christian, you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, that is, you've never, you don't believe in your heart, and you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that God raised you from the dead, today you can become a Christian. And you can be baptized. Amen. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. If you are a believer, but you've never heard about water baptism taught from the scriptures, and you've never been water baptized, we have a pool of lovely warm water. Today, you can be baptized. If you didn't bring clothes, we've got spare clothes, we've got spare towels, we've got everything we need. Nothing can hinder you. You can be baptized today. That's the second thing. The third thing is this. If you are a believer and you've been baptized in water, 
Today is a great opportunity for you once again to lay hold of, by faith, the reality of your water baptism in Jesus Christ, no matter how many years ago, that today it has the reality. Today, you live in the good of this. By faith, the old life is gone. And the newness of life in Jesus Christ is mine to live by faith. So no one is exempt today. None of this is just for our information. Everything is to be grabbed hold of by faith. Now, we're going to look at lots of scriptures today. In fact, we don't have time to look at them all. So uh, my friend Will at the back, he's going to do his best to keep up with me, and scriptures will appear. <laughs> but the first scripture I want to take you to is in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. And it simply reads this. I'm going to read this one from the New Living Translation. I believe thereafter all other versions that will appear on the screen from the New International Version. On the day of Pentecost, people were cut to the heart, having heard pre Peter preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter replies, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What must we do to be saved? We've learned just before Easter with James. We must repent. That is, I've been going one way. I do the great 180, the turnaround, a complete change of mind about who I am in the light of the truth of the gospel and who Jesus Christ is. And I turn my life 180 degrees around. Not 179, not 181. I'm going back the way I came because I came this way from God. Sin has separated me. I've been walking away like the prodigal son, but I'm turning my life around in repentance. And then in faith, because repentance is not static, it works with faith. It helps me move towards God, because as we read just together at the end of our, our time last week, the righteous will live by faith. How do the righteous live? By faith. By faith. So repentance and faith. What must we do to be saved? Repent, turn towards God, and be baptized. Now, sometimes we refer to this as the Peter package, the normal Christian birth. This is how it should be. I'm fairly certain if we took a, a small survey, uh, maybe most of us would not have been uh, repented, put our faith in God and water baptized in so quick a fashion. But this is what the Bible teaches. And we'll see as we look at other scriptures today, there's no hindrance or delay to people being baptized in water. But actually, the complete opposite of what you see, the, uh, what, uh, what you think, we see a great delight and, a, 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 and a, such an urgency, such an intensity, such an immediacy. Here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Yeah. We're going to put two scriptures, if you'll do this one for me well. Uh, first in Galatians 2.20. We looked at these scriptures last week with Josh. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith. Now I can read that a thousand times with no faith and nothing will happen. But I can read that scripture once with faith in my heart and nothing will ever be the same again. The life we live, uh, the, the, the old day died. He was buried. A new day, the new life emerged out of the water. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Yeah. Similarly, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's the scripture which we have above our baptistry, it simply says this, therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Where's the old? It's gone. Where's the new? It's come. And there's not... Uh, uh, the old is made new. Don't believe that lie. It's not like God did something with the old to cover it up and repackage it in some way. No, the old is completely gone. And the new man in Christ has come out of the water. As Zoe would tell me from time to time, uh, that's at the bottom of the baptistry. It's not who you are anymore. I'm alive in Christ. So today is a day to put faith into action, no matter how long ago you were baptized in water, by saying, the reality of that is still mine today. Yeah, yeah. These are not one-off tick boxes. Yet, repentance, tick. Faith in God, tick. 
go to church, tick, water baptize, tick, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, tick. Yeah, I did that, and now I'm just moving on my own life. No, we live in the good of these every day. That's why they are called foundations. And foundations are important. We talked with the youth a few weeks ago about the huge skyscraper in Dubai, if you've ever been there. Uh, the, I think it's the Burj Khalifa, 828 meters high. But before they put one brick above the ground, they dug down for 18 months, 50 meters. And they put so much concrete and steel rebar that if you took all that steel and put it end to end, it would uh, wrap around a quarter of the earth. And it holds it up. Friends, if you want to build something big for Jesus Christ in your life, you've got to dig down deep for the foundation. If you want to see something wonderful emerge uh, out of your life for his glory and only his glory, then it's not glamorous. You've got to dig deep. And you've got to wrestle uh, with things to say no to things and yes to God. Yes. To Amen. dig down deep. Amen. Today is a day to put our faith into action. So why water baptism? In the 21st century, it seems an odd practice. If you've never seen anybody baptized in water, it's simply this, just... In very practical, what the eye would see, a person would go down into a body of water with someone else, then they might have a little conversation, then that person would go all the way under the water, and all the way back out, and people go wild. And you think, what a strange practice. And completely, if you don't mind me saying, very inconvenient. I've got places to be. Well, in the first century, they understood. There's enough in the Old Testament to prepare their hearts so that when John the Baptist comes onto the scene and then Jesus comes onto the scene and then the apostles in the first church, they begin to teach and preach what Jesus had told them to do, that people understood there's water, why shouldn't I be baptized? There's so much to read. In fact, you don't have to read much of your Bible, in fact, only the first few verses, to find that God, and I don't know why, I'm still looking into this, but God just seems to love water. The first time we meet God, he, the Holy Spirit's hovering over the waters. A few verses later, it says that he, he gathers up the waters and he separates the water and he brings land up out of it. There's just something about God that loves water in the, te uh, the tabernacle before the high priest and the priest could serve or go into the Holy of Holies. They had to uh, wash and they had to bathe. They had to prepare themselves to go into the presence of God for the people of Israel to come uh, completely out of slavery and into the promised land. They had to go through the water. There's just something about water that God seems to take delight in. Jesus bursts onto the scene uh, at his baptism. He comes up out of the water and God speaks. This is my son whom I absolutely am mad about. I love him. He's my beloved son. Jesus comes out of the water. Jesus calls his first disciples as he's walking along the Sea of Galilee. Jesus' first miracle, he brings water, uh, wine out of water. I know he said it the other way around. It's not. It's wine from the water. Jesus reveals aspects of his nature, of his, his authority, by calming stormy seas, by walking on water. There's something about water that God loves. He says to the lady in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, says, uh, you're talking about just physical water. If you drink the water I'll give you, you'll never thirst again. And what's more, it will well up, spring up unto eternal life. There's something about water that God loves. Now, I can see it in some of your eyes, Dave, you're going too far. Well, I just love this stuff. The Bible of God is awesome. The, the Word of God is awesome. It really is. And I'd encourage you, well, do your own studies and, and see if you come to a different conclusion. But what I know is this, is when God sees water, he sees an opportunity to advance his own purposes and the people of God within his purpose. That's why even in water baptism, such a simple act, Something happens, something happens yeah. in the water. Yeah. You don't need to have full understanding about the Greek and uh, the biblical knowledge about what baptism is in order to be baptized. Right. You don't need to go through any 10 week course or become a certain age uh, to prepare you to be water baptized. All you need is this, faith and obedience. Yeah. Yeah. Faith and obedience and God will meet you. Why? Because something happens in the water. Friends, water baptism is critical. It's not, as we'll see later on, it's not an optional extra. It's not, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, but I'll leave that bit. We don't get to pick and choose. This is vital for your life in Christ. It's so vital that Jesus commands it. Matthew 28, 19. It'll appear on the screen behind me. 
Jesus commands him. Water baptism is a command of Christ. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Very simply, if Jesus commands it, we need to do it. I learned many things from my mum and dad, but one of the principal things I learned as a very young child is this. If Jesus says it, do it. If Jesus thinks of that way, think that way. If Jesus talks like that, talk like him. In all ways, we are to imitate Christ. And it's important how Jesus phrases it there. He says, uh, and baptize them in the name of the Father. It's because when we are baptized in water, something happens. It's not just a ritual. It's not just ceremonial. Something happens. And to baptize someone into the name of means this. They are now in complete union, complete association with the name into which they were baptized. When you and I, no matter how many years ago, decades ago perhaps, went through the waters of baptize, baptism, as you came up, you were baptized into com- absolute union and association with Jesus Christ. He said, they're mine. It's wonderful. Sadly, in a lot of Christian circles, that's been downplayed. It's become simply a ceremony. Or it's become you're baptized into a church. Or you're baptized into a denomination. Friends, you do not need to be baptized uh, into All Nations Church. You do need to be baptized into Christ. And the church needs to come alive to this again. It's a, a central part of our gospel that we mustn't dilute for the sake of convenience or offense. We preach water baptism here at All Nations Church. It's interesting that other religions are far more aware of the significance of water baptism sometimes than Christians are. We've got many friends, many testimonies we could share that when people from uh, Hindu, uh, the Hindu religion or from Islam, uh, they started to follow Jesus or get interested in Jesus, it wasn't too big a deal, particularly for Hinduism. Jesus is just another God amongst gods. But when they said they wanted to be baptized, that's when they, they received trouble from their own families because they understood that this is a cutting off of every other false god. And they are choosing to be baptized into the one true God, Jesus Christ. They understand it's a cutting off of dead religion into the living Christ, Jesus. So, we're going to look at three questions very quickly. And I've suddenly realized I left my stopwatch at home. So I have no idea what time it is. So I'm going to do my best. Three questions. Practically, what is it? Secondly, who is it for? And perhaps most importantly, and some of this will be picked up in the seminars, I do encourage you, do everything you can to be there. It is the most important event happening this week for the church. Thirdly, what happens? Let me take you to a scripture in Acts chapter 16. Will, if you could bring that one up. It's Acts chapter 16, if you want to look at it, verses 13 to 15. We're going to read a little bit of a story Um, And then we're going to see that actually what's taking place here is something bigger than we first realized. So Acts 16, 13 to 15. I'm just going to read from what's on my screen here. It may not match exactly word for word with what's behind me. It says this. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira a seller of purple goods who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us to do so. Such a simple little story. But we meet here a fantastic lady called Lydia. She responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ and she's baptized in water and her household. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. But what's happening here, we have a little glimpse into a much bigger reality than the text would perhaps show. See, Lydia is a lovely lady. She's probably quite a wealthy lady. She's either a merchant, a seller or a trader, or she's a lady who is actually doing the dyeing of fabric into, into making purple cloth. And that's important for this uh, illustration only. Purple uh, was uh, such an expensive color. 
It really was. In fact, when you read, if you like colors and numbers and stuff, come and talk to me. I love it. But when you read about purple in scripture, it pretty much will always denote something of royalty, sometimes of priesthood, but it's expensive. The reason it's expensive, because again, if you like this sort of stuff, it's where theology and history collides, and I'm in my happy place. But uh, it's not, you couldn't just go down to home bargains and buy a little bottle of purple coloring to put into the water to make beautiful cloth. You had to gather a certain, uh, some people think it's a snail, some people think it's like a little crustacean or a mollusk, and you had to get about 9,000 of these things and crush them to create one gram of purple dye. It was so expensive. It was so expensive that uh, legend has it that Caesar Augustus Aurelius, um, uh, Marcus Aurelius, I beg your pardon, uh, his wife saw this beautiful purple cloth and Caesar said, you can't buy it, it's too expensive. Caesar said that. <laughs> Emperors tried to ban the sale of purple stuff so it would only be something that they could wear to denote just how important it was. And what's happening here is our friend Lydia is she's taking just cloth. It's just ordinary cloth. It's nothing special about it. And she's down by the riverside and she's done all the hard work and she begins to dye the cloth. She just begins to get it in there and work it through. And just what happens is what comes out is something amazing. <laughs> I'm Britain's Got Talent next week. <laughs> Don't miss it. Don't miss it, okay? I'm going to do it again for you. <laughs> she takes something which is ordinary, something that has no value in the world, something that is plain, something that people walk by, something that is thought nothing of, and she puts it in the waters and out of it comes something which is beyond price, something which is spectacular. She's put this simple cloth into something that uh, was so expensive, so valuable, it was crushed in order to get the value out of it, and it's transferred somehow onto the cloth, and the same cloth emerges, and yet it's not the same at all. Because the old now has gone, and the new has come. Now why are you telling us that? I'm telling you that simply because this. What she's doing, if we were Greek people, is she's baptizing. Because the word, the Greek word, baptizo, that we read in Acts 2, in Matthew 28, that we just read here in Acts 16, is the word baptizo, or baptizo. It's a very common word. It's not a spiritual word. It means simply this, to immerse to dunk, to plunge. That's what she's doing. If any of you on your Bible app, you find the literal uh, standard version, the LSV, you'll find that that word is translated to immerse. Go into all the world and immerse them. That's what she's doing. Now, uh, the other thing to say is that it, is this Greek word is never passive. This has become important. It's never passive. It's never that the water is taken and poured or sprinkled onto the object. The object always goes into and under, baptized into that thing. That becomes very important when we talk about what is water baptism and who is it for. It was a very common word. Now, most of the New Testament that we have was written, written in Greek and translated into English. That's how we know what it means. But there are certain words, and baptize or baptism is one of them, where they weren't translated, they were transliterated. Stay with me. The reason this word was not translated from baptism into immerse is because there were very powerful people who uh, were part of a particular denomination that believed in baptism by sprinkling. And people said, we're not going to rock the boat. We're not going to change that word. We're just going to transliterate it. What does that mean? They put the English alphabet on top of the Greek alphabet. The Greek word's baptizo, beta, okay, that's our B. Alpha, that's our A, and so on. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that. But that's what happened. I wonder how much more readily we would accept that uh, water baptism, as the Bible teaches it, is by full immersion if that one word had been translated. But because it wasn't, it's become uh, just a catalyst to perpetuate a lie that you can uh, baptize a child or a baby just by sprinkling some water on it. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. One of my favorite examples of this word is 300 years before Jesus Christ comes onto the scene, 300 BC, the Greek poet and physician Nicander 
he, uh, as well as all the incredibly clever things he did, he also wrote recipes. And you can look this up on the internet, it's all there. Uh, you can read his works. And he wrote a recipe for making the perfect pickle. <laughs> and he says this, the final step is to baptize the vegetable in the vinegar solution. And he notes, for it is the act of baptizing the vegetable that produces a permanent change. What's he saying there? He's not saying just sprinkle some of the vinegar on it. He said, get it in there. Immerse it, submerge it, plunge it, dunk it down. Get on there, why? Because that's gonna create a permanent change. Now, you're hearing natural things, but I'm giving you a spiritual principle. Get under the water. You come out, the old is gone, and the new has come. Baptisms by full immersion. If you're here today and you say you've been baptized in water, but what you mean is you were christened as a baby, I'm here to tell you and open the word of truth to you, you have not been baptized into Jesus Christ, but you can be today. So that brings us to another question. Who is water baptism for? Romans 10, verse 9 to 10. Josh looked at this scripture last week. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Baptism in water is for those who believe and confess. And as cute and cuddly as they are, babies can't do that. Water baptism, as the Bible teaches, is for believers. It's for believers. Infant or baby baptism was introduced around the third century, probably out of a, a good intention when infant mortality rates were just through the roof and parents were desperate that if their children, uh, somehow if they died when they were so young that they would go to hell and not be with God. And so this is brought in. It comes from a good intention, but it's a lie. It's a lie. And it perpetuates a lie that people who have been christened as babies are saved and don't need Jesus. We've got to cut that off. We've got to be unashamed. This is what the gospel is. This is what the Bible teaches. The arguments for, for still today for baby sprinkling as baptism are, are purely from tradition, from history, or from the misapplication of scriptures. And it doesn't take very long to see that they don't stand up. They don't stand up because the word of God is the word of God and it's very clear. And the word of God always has greater authority than history and tradition. Yeah. Amen. So nothing really stands up. In fact, there are over 30 separate passages in the Bible about water baptism in the New Testament alone, none of which describe or can be applied to a baby. The scriptures back this up multiple times. I'm just going to read these out to you. These won't appear on the screen. But if you want any of these references, please come and see me afterwards. Acts chapter 2, 41, it speaks of those who received the word were baptized. Acts 8, 12, they accepted the good news and were baptized. Acts 16, after listening, Lydia opened her heart and was baptized. Later on in Acts 16, the jailer heard and responded and was baptized. And Acts 18, after hearing Paul, they believed in the Lord and they were baptized and so on and so on. Those who were baptized were those who heard, believed, and confessed. Amen. That is, they accepted, responded, and spoke. And I love babies, but they can't do that. There's more, even a greater weight of evidence when you see that those who are water baptized are then have this wonderful experience of the baptism, the immersion, we'll come on to that next week, into the Holy Spirit. And they speak with other tongues, like we've heard this morning. Babies can't do that either. So, well, Dave, what about households? You mentioned households. What if there's a baby in the household? I want to be very quick but very uh, deliberate about this. Household in the Bible, in the Greek language, does not mean the same as family. They're two very different words. Household is the Greek word oikos. Family is the word patria. A household could mean anybody under the roof. It could mean servants. It could mean lodgers. It could mean slaves back in the day. Well, could it mean babies as well? Then you come down to the other weight of evidence is this is that it's all about the emphasis is always on those who be heard, believed, and confessed. And these things, you go back all around the circle, you come back to this. Water baptism is for who? It's for believers in Jesus Christ. Now I gave my life, I want to be very clear, I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was five. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. I've never looked back. Some of you may have given your life to Jesus in the last few weeks. Praise God. Hallelujah. You'll never look back. Now, for me being five, my dad was very deliberate. Did I understand what I was saying? Did I understand what I was doing? Had I heard? Was I believing? And did I confess? And on the confession of your faith, I was baptized in water. Because it's on the confession of your faith. Another thing we have to look at as well, when we talk about who's it for, is the immediacy from here. And have a read of the the story in Acts 16, towards the end of the chapter, about the jailer. who the, We know the story, we've talked about it uh, quite a few times here. Uh, Paul and Silas are in the inner jail, they're singing praises to God at midnight, and uh, uh, there's an earthquake, and all the chains fall off, and all the gates go through, and the jailer's about to commit suicide because he's failed in his job, and he'd rather take his own life than find himself at the mercy of the Romans. And Paul says, no, well, stop, we're all still here. And he preaches the gospel to the jailer and he gives his life to him. And he doesn't even wait for daylight to come to be baptized. So here's the question to you. Why would we preach or teach that anyone has to wait? When the weight of scripture tells us that if you've heard, if you've believed, if you've confessed. Well, here's water. My favorite story about water baptism is in Acts chapter 8. Philip is running alongside a, 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 a chariot of sorts because he hears someone reading aloud from the scroll of Isaiah. And he gets in, he joins in, uh, and he says, do you know what you're reading? How am I supposed to know unless someone explains it to me? Oh, well, it was a good job I was here. Hi, I'm Phil. And he explains to Isaiah all the things about Jesus, and somehow from the Old Testament, because of their understanding, he goes on, gives him the full gospel, and the Ethiopian says, well, look, here's water, not a puddle on the floor, they're probably by the Mediterranean. Here's water, why shouldn't I be baptized? And so he was. Look at the pace, look at the urgency, look at the immediacy, look at the desire. I want to ask you, if you are a believer, you love Jesus, but you've not been baptized in water, can I ask you, why not? Jesus exhorts you to, the Bible exhorts you to, and here's water. Why shouldn't you be baptized? If you love Jesus, don't delay. Have an encounter with him, why? Because something happens in the water. Well, I'd like my family and my friends to be here. Come and have a conversation with us. The most important thing you need to know is this. Don't delay. Don't delay. Get into the water. Friends, water baptism is a foundation of the Christian life. I said before, I'll say it again. It's not an optional extra. It's power for living. It's a clear command of Christ. It's the clear commission of the church. Peter, Paul, Philip, they all preach it and teach it. We mustn't, we mustn't dilute our gospel. It's the first opportunity for anyone who comes to Christ as a new believer in him to express their obedience. Because what does it mean to say, I repent of my old way of life. I've turned around, I'm faith, I'm moving to God. And the first thing Jesus or the Bible commands us to do is be baptized. We say, well... Jesus says in Luke 6, why do you say, Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Don't delay and I, I say this with all the grace I can, meaning to offend nobody, but happy to if it needs to be said. If you, are, if you confess yourself to be a Christian, and the, the Bible presents to you an overwhelming case from the words of Jesus and the early church that you should be baptized in water, and you have said no, I have a question about if you're really saved. And really, so should you. But I want to encourage you with no word of condemnation. Hear the truth. Be baptized in water. Meet God. Meet Jesus under the water so the old would be gone and the new would come. Amen. So, what happens in the water? There's an old man that needs burying. He's dead. You know what happens to dead bodies? They're buried. You know, it used to be an old uh, a Roman execution method, or a, a, certainly a torture method, that they would strap a dead body onto the back of somebody for them to walk around with, that the rotting flesh would then uh, poison your own flesh. Old bodies have to be buried. Dead bodies have to be buried because something happens in the water. It's an outward expression of an inward reality. It's by faith that our sins have been forgiven, our faith is put in Jesus, Christ and, in Jesus Christ, and the water baptism washes that away, Acts 22, 16, 
And I says to Paul, now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Very quickly, this one. Water baptism is a cutting off of the old life. The Old Testament sheds some light on this too. Sometimes we call these shadows or types where there are stories or uh, things, true stories which happen in the history of the people of God that are just foreshadowing a reality, a fullness that's to come in Jesus Christ. We have the flood in Genesis 6. What is that? The waters represent God's judgment. The ark uh, always represents uh, the presence of God or, or, or uh, Christ. And Noah and his family, they go through the waters of judgment in Christ. They go through the waters in the ark. And when they emerge, the old literally has gone. And they emerge to a new life. You can read about that in 1 Peter chapter 3. The New Testament writers pick up on that. Perhaps the most famous is this, is uh, the Exodus, where they go through the Red Sea. Anybody familiar with that story? You can read about it in Exodus 14. My only question ever about that is, why does God take them that way? If you ever happen to glance at the maps, you know the maps you've got in your Bible? Right at the back? Like, why, why are these here? Why am I ever going to need that? I've got sat now. Why am I ever going to need this map? One of your maps might be uh, the map of the Exodus. And I, I look at those sometimes and think, Lord, when they came out of Egypt, why didn't you just send them left? <laughs> they would have avoided all of this. Why did God take them to the waters? Let me tell you why God took them to the waters. Because he was going to take them through so that the old would be completely cut off behind them. Yeah, it's not like the movies. It's not like the prince of Egypt where somehow Pharaoh gets washed up back on the rocks and curse you, Moses. <laughs> He's dead. The old has gone. The new has come. The promised land is before them. Slavery and everything is behind them. They've been delivered. The New Testament writers take this up and say they were baptized into Moses. What does that mean? They're baptized into the one who delivers them. And through the waters of baptism. Now we're baptized into Christ. The old is gone. He brings you to the waters. Not so you can have a ceremony. Not so you can have dim lights and tea tree lights and candles and nice music. And isn't it swoony and all glorious? No, it's so that the old self can be buried. And the new life can be raised in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 11.29 tells us, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea. On dry, on, as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. What's the key here? The Israelites followed God by faith. But when the Egyptians tried to do something in their understanding and in their own strength, they were cut off. It's a cleansing, it's a cutting off. Water baptism is a raising to newness of life. Romans chapter 6, 3 to 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I love that. Did you know, I love, I love, I love, when Paul writes, don't you know, most of us go, no, actually, that's, that's good. Well, I'm about to tell you, don't you know, you were buried with him. The old was cut off. In him. And you've been raised to life, joining with him in his resurrection. One writer says this, The believer is not so much laid in their own grave, but rather laid alongside Christ in his. Such is the union. Total union in his death. But total union with his resurrection. And that word into newness of life is the Greek word kainoteti. And it means a brand new kind. A brand new quality, again, it's not the old, made new, repackaged, Dave 2.0. No, it's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come on. Let's read on from there. Romans 6 and verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Hallelujah! For one who has died has been set free from sin. 
Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11. So, you also must count, consider, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Something happens in the water. The old is gone and the new has come. Read Romans 6, the first 11, 12, 13 verses later on today. Pour over them, ponder on them. It's wonderful. All the truth of it is right there. We've died to sin when we're uh, baptized into Christ. The old life's dead and buried through baptism. Our old self has been crucified, put to death with Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. Sin no longer is our master. And why? Because we came out of the water. And in so doing, by faith, we've been united with Christ in his resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why it's God's intention that water baptism is for every believer. Because it's his intention that every believer lives in the fullness of resurrection life. That's for us. Purchased by Jesus. Laid hold of today by faith. Well, Dave, I was baptized years ago and I was saying, by faith. Colossians 2.12 emphasizes this. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. We bring this thing hopefully into land. My last scripture is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to verse 28. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Two powerful things. Firstly, water baptism affects the church. Because when you were water baptized, two things happened. Not only were you baptized into Christ, you were also baptized into his body. You're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ. That's why, and again, I don't mean to upset or offend anybody. But when a water baptism takes place, we should be flocking around that baptistry, so excited, so absolutely overwhelmed with what's happening for the person who's being buried and raised in newness of life in Christ, but also to the church. Wow, they've been baptized into us. They're a part of my family. They're my brother. They're my sister. It shouldn't be a sideshow. They're baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For we were all baptized by, by one spirit, as to form one body. That's why in water baptism, there should be much rejoicing. Yeah. I do not think it's a coincidence, by the way, that when there is a baptism, the people that are first on the scene to celebrate are children. Yeah. It's something exciting. Something's happening in the water. I want to see it. I want a front row seat. I love to see the young ones. Like, <laughs> What's going on? Oh, come on, church. Let's be like that. What's going on? What's going on in the water? I know what's going on. The old is being taken away and newness of life is coming. But there's one other thing very quickly. I'm going to grab another town. You know what's coming. We were nothing separated from God by our sin. Ordinary, plain, very little value, with nothing that we could do to get right with God, but God in his mercy sent his begotten son, his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, friends, you can know him for the very first time. 
In a moment, for those of us who are believers, Christians, we heard the gospel. There was a moment of grace, quickened by a gift of faith within us that we responded. We turned around from our old way of life, 180 degrees. We put our faith that we walked towards God. And by obedience, we went down into the waters of baptism. Not a sprinkling, not a pouring, but full immersion. And as we went in there, under the waters, even though it may be only for a second, we were baptized not just in water, not just for a ceremony, not just for a ritual, but something tremendous happened, that something emerged. And the Bible says in Galatians 3 that all who have been baptized have put on Christ. And something emerged so powerful that the old plane has gone and the new resplendent, expensive royalty of the children of God have come. The old is gone, folks. The new has come. Dave, I was baptized years ago. So was I. You know what? Today, by faith, I'm standing in the best of it. I'm standing in the best of it. Whatever has held you back, whatever you may have been struggling with ever since you gave your life to Jesus Christ, by faith do this. Reckon that it's dead because it is. Because it's not a part of your new nature, your new identity in Christ Jesus. That old has gone. And the newness of life has come. I've repented of our old way of life. I've put my faith in God and God by his grace and his mercy has forgiven me. And what's more, that old life has been cut off and I can't go back to it. It's at the bottom of the baptistry. It's gone. Cut off, separated by the water. The issue was declared dead at the cross. Buried with him in his burial when I was baptized. And by faith in God, whatever it is that hinders a life in Christ, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of resurrection life, whatever it is, by faith in God, it has no power over you anymore. Why? Because the old is gone and the new has come. And even more than that, as I came out of the water, something happened. I've been united. I've been raised with Christ by the power of his own resurrection so that I can live, so that you can live, a brand new resurrection powered life by faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, whether you were baptized last week or a year ago or 40 years ago, it doesn't matter. Today is a day of reckoning that by faith, Lord Jesus, I want to say thank you that I'm just shoring up that foundation again in my life. I know who I am in you. I'm not the old. I am the new in Christ. I'm not the old repackaged and made new. I am the completely brand new newness of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you're struggling with anything, reckon it dead by faith. Stop it. If there's sin in your life, stop it. Because that's not who you are. As a child of God, the old has gone. The new has come. I've taken far too much time and I apologize for that. But I would say one final appeal. If you'd like to know more about this exciting life, Tuesday and Wednesday this week, here at the All Nation Center, 7.30, be there. Come ready to learn. Come ready to be refreshed. Come, be come ready to remember again the fullness of life in Christ that's purchased for you at the cross and is yours in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you for your word. I want to say thank you for your word that speaks so clearly. And I just pray right now, Lord God, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that it would be a moment that we would reach by faith to lay hold of the reality of what took place by water baptism. And Lord Jesus, I pray right now for anyone who is a believer but has never been fully immersed and gone into the waters by faith. Lord Jesus, no matter how long ago it was, when they gave their life to you, Lord Jesus, Quicken them right now. Quicken them right now to say, it's not that I want to, I need to be baptized. I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.